<laughs> okay, everyone, let's, let's get underway. Sorry that we're uh, a couple of minutes uh, late, but uh, there's still plenty of time for this fascinating debate about uh, relationship between the European Union and UK institutions, particularly Parliament. I'm told to emphasize that this is not a political debate about uh, Europe, but very much a debate about understanding uh, the institutions involved and relationships. And it's part of uh, very much a project by um, the Houses of Parliament Outreach Service to develop an understanding of processes and institutions. Anyway, I'm looking forward, uh, as a business and economics correspondent at BBC News, uh, looking forward very much to improving my understanding of uh, the workings of the EU and the British Parliament. I'd just like to introduce uh, our guests, Lord Boswell, uh, formerly Tim Boswell MP, Conservative MP, now crossbench a member of the House of Lords, Chairman of the EU Select Committee. Uh, I've got Professor on my left here, Professor Andrea Biondi, uh, Professor of European Law here at King's College London, uh, Bill Cash MP, uh, MP for Stafford, and at the far left, my left, Sarah Davis, Clerk of the European Scrutiny Committee, House of Commons, and on my far right, Jake Vaughan, Clerk of the EU Select Committee, House of Lords. Now, I'm going to ask each speaker, the main speakers, to stick to five minutes, and I will be rather tough if they go much beyond five minutes, and that gives plenty of time for everyone to ask their own questions and chip in. So I'd like to start with Lord Boswell to uh, give us the opening uh, five-minute presentation. Thank you very much, Lord Boswell. Well, thank you very much, Chairman, and good evening. Uh, not many people know as much as they should about the House of Lords. Having moved from one house to the other, I suspect I used to be one of them. Uh, but I just want to give you an outline about how we handle EU affairs. It's very much core business as far as the Lords is concerned, which goes back to some rather far-sighted decisions at the time of British entry 40 years ago, when we established a committee and a committee structure uh, to look at, in broad terms, uh, European Union documents and matters relating to the European Union. How this works in practice is roughly like this. Um, every document uh, which has relevance to the European Union, Commission working papers, for example, um, are deposited by the various, they're received by the British government departments, and they're deposited with us with an explanatory memorandum uh, tabled by Her Majesty's government, which is meant to explain what they say. As far as I'm concerned, the cardinal sin is an explanatory memorandum which fails to explain, and a few do, I'm afraid. Um, then goes into a number of checklist items. Does it apply to Gibraltar, for example? Some do, some don't. Uh, is there a subsidiarity concern? There sometimes is, sometimes there is not. Um, and what the policy implications are. So it will become obvious from that that we are looking at um, the documents received which are current business for the European Union at one level or another or reports on activities of the Union and we're looking at the British government's interface with that. The bit we don't actually do is legislation in the UK Parliament about um, uh, British affairs because that is domestic and we've got our own machinery for that. But in order to look at this fairly substantial volume of work, that is a little short of a thousand documents a year, we have a structure which is surprisingly large. Um, we have one overarching European Union Select Committee with just under 20 members, which I chair, and then we have all those and other members uh, form part of six subcommittees uh, which look at specific subject areas, finance, economics on the one hand, uh, internal market, um, and a number of other issues, labor and transport issues, that's number two. External affairs of the European Union is three, or C. Um, energy, environment and agriculture, uh, justice and institutions, and then home affairs and justice matters, that's six committees. And the way it is operated is on Monday, rather like some superannuated Stalinist, I sit there with a complete box of European Union papers, or if I'm really lucky, two boxes, uh, with a set of uh, explanatory memoranda with covering notes from the legal team we have. Uh, and um, I, as it were, triage them, uh, and I will either mark them as items which are suitable or appropriate for, to be held under scrutiny 
by the European Union Committee to be cleared or in some intermediate category to be sent to a subcommittee for their information or possibly for something called super information which is when uh, you tell them to all take note of it particularly. And uh, while those documents are held in, under scrutiny, uh, there is a reserve. British ministers are not meant to make decisions until they are cleared from scrutiny. Now, in practice, we have, and that triggers a continuing dialogue, and some departments, and I know at least one coordinator is here, do better than others, or are more alert to our interests than others. Occasionally, you have to put the boot in. And I have written more rude letters in my current capacity than I ever did in nearly 25 years as an MP, but that makes me feel better. Now, how it works, I couldn't possibly do it on my own. We have these six committees. The number of peers engaged is nearly 10% of the total number. It's um, 75, roughly. Uh, and rounding the terms, we have a staff of about 25, including the legal advisors and the clerks I mentioned, the policy analysts. And as these go out to the various committees, this is their job to do detailed scrutiny and um, to um, consider them further and see whether they, the scrutiny reserve can then be lifted and to undertake a dialogue with ministers. Now, what this means in practice is, um, I think, the dialogue uh, in various forms and, the, um, uh, and, if not the clearance, um, the continuing correspondence, all of which is on, in the public domain, uh, unless and until it is finally dispatched. Um, it also generates a capacity for inquiries on the back of those scrutiny requirements and self-generated inquiries by the committee. I'll give you an example. Our overall committee is currently about to undertake one into the role of national parliaments in the European Union. Um, it's a huge volume of work. The way the Lords is structured makes it particularly appropriate for the detailed subcommittees to give detailed scrutiny to the um, uh, individual items. Uh, and we do produce some very detailed reports. Occasionally, I think government departments are a little bit put, put out that we ask such detailed questions. But um, I'll give you an example of two things we've done recently. The financial um, uh, transactions tax, where we produced an extremely critical report and said to the government, you've got to do something about this which they've now done. Uh, and another one was on women in boards. And genuinely, I think, across the political divide, um, there was no um, dissent uh, from the principle of getting more women onto boards, but there was a considerable dissent about whether or not um, this required to be done at European level, which brings me neatly to the issue of subsidiarity, which is um, whether or not action should be taken at European level, which or could be better discharged at the level of the member states and um, also proportionality, which is a slum, somewhat fuzzier concept. Uh, and we have now, under the Lisbon Treaty, the opportunity of uh, playing the yellow card uh, together with other, um, your, um, other national parliaments. We have to get, I think it's 18 uh, houses. Some have one, parliament, one house in parliament, some have two, to raise a formal objection. But we are not only in dialogue with our own government, but of course with the Commission and otherwise. I, do, I just don't want to prolong this now, so I, let me just pick up some themes. I think the first one is there's a clear interest in engaging national parliaments more closely, and perhaps doing it on a slightly less literal basis, on, simply on subsidiarity issues. It's about saying, look, we, we're worried about this. We don't think it's the right thing to do. We don't think you've thought out the details. Um, and let's have a discussion either with the Commission or through Her Majesty's Government. Uh, there's a strong interest in what we would call outreach events like this to explain what we're doing, because it can often sound very technical, but it's still very necessary. There's a quite strong interest in what we call inreach, which is making sure that our colleagues in other parts of the House of Lords are aware of what we're doing and its importance. And above all, and I'll conclude on that at this stage, there is a very strong interest in getting a closer citizen's understanding of what we're all about in this very complicated process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim Boswell. I'd now like to ask Bill Cash, um, long-standing expert on European affairs, chairman of the House of Commons uh, Scrutiny Committee.
uh, on European affairs to speak now. Bill. Thank you very much indeed. Um, could I just say, first of all, that uh, one small thing which has changed in the last uh, uh, 40 years since we joined the European Union or war uh, is that I'm the first elected chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee. Uh, hitherto, it's always been the power of the whips. If it was down to the whips, I'm quite sure I wouldn't be chairman. Having said that, however, we have a very harmonious committee, and I'm very grateful to you, Tim, for giving such a good explanation of the process uh, from the House of Lords' point of view, because there are very considerable similarities with ours, with one exception, or two exceptions, and that is that um, we don't go into debates on the theme basis. Uh, we go through every document. So of all the thousand documents that Tim referred to, we go through every one religiously every Wednesday, and then we decide under our standing orders, it's not a whim, it's laid down by Parliament, um, that we have to decide in the committee which has um, about, what is it, 14 members all told, um, the uh, decision as to whether or not we want to recommend it for debate. So if we want to recommend it for debate, it's on the basis of whether it is political or legal. And this is all laid down by our standing orders. So we make the decision on that footing. And the same provision relating to scrutiny reserve applies to what we say as in the House of Lords and woe betide any minister, except in exceptional circumstances, who goes ahead and makes a decision in the Council of Ministers uh, if we've said it should be debated and they just simply willfully ignore it. There are exceptional circumstances and we do exercise a degree of discretion, but we are pretty tough on it. And if they do it uh, in a manner which we regard as unacceptable, then we haul them in front of the committee and there we are. Uh, we will then expect them to explain themselves. Um, the debates take place in two main forums. Uh, <coughs> the European Standing Committees, um, of which there are three, uh, do not have at the moment a permanent membership, but what that means is that they're appointed by the whips to turn up on a particular day, and then the minister has to respond after there's been about an hour and a half's examination of the issue in question, uh, where people in the committee on either side of the chamber, that is, in committee, not on the floor of the House, ask questions about the issue in question to the minister. And as one recent minister uh, who gave evidence to an inquiry, I'll mention in a minute, said, uh, this is quite a grueling experience. Uh, because they really have to do, know their stuff. Uh, my committee at the moment is <coughs> proposing, uh, well, we're holding a, an inquiry into European scrutiny, because as chairman, I wanted to sort out two things in my new capacity, and uh, having been on the committee since 1985, right, so that's quite a long time, therefore I have quite a lot of knowledge of what's been going on over all those years, and uh, having been elected two and a half years ago, uh, my first step was to set up an inquiry into the relationship between British sovereignty and the European Union. And we managed to dispense with a number of uh, well-established uh, myths uh, about sovereignty because our sovereignty remains in the United Kingdom Parliament and it will stay there. Uh, the second thing is with respect to the question of uh, the whole business of uh, in the scrutiny process itself. And I decided, and my committee agreed, that we should have an inquiry into the nature of scrutiny. Because, and that's not with regard to what goes on in the House of Lords, this is to do with us. We want to improve it. Because I personally have long believed that there is something of a disconnection. And we are improving it. We've had a report, in fact the draft report is uh, going to be given to me this evening because we've completed our inquiry to a great extent and uh, we're now moving into the next phase of publication, etc. Now, that is the process and I'm very happy to answer questions and Sarah Davis, my uh, distinguished uh, clerk of the committee, is here and she will answer other questions as well. But I want to come on to another matter because I'm not going to take up more than my allotted time. But I'm going to say this.
Uh, on the piece of paper that you've got, right, which is the method of getting as many of you here as possible, I suppose, not just to hear about process, but to hear about issues. Has the UK membership benefited the UK? Question mark. Do, what does the future hold for the UK and Europe? Question mark. How does Parliament debate EU issues? Well, the second, the third point about the debating issues, I've covered to some extent in the five minutes allotted to me. I'm not going to deal with that, but I am going to deal with the first two very quickly, and I'm going to say what I think, and I'm going to step back uh, from my position as chairman of the committee, and I'm going to tell you what I think as a member of Parliament, who is one of the signatories to the referendum bill, uh, which has been deposited and on which questions can be taken later if you want. Um, and the bottom line is, I don't think that the EU membership has always benefited the UK, although I do think there are certain elements within the framework of cooperation in Europe where we can benefit. Um, in a nutshell, and of interest no doubt to our distinguished chairman, um, just to take one statistic, uh, we've been told the single market is absolutely fantastic. It's the jewel in the crown. The trade deficit between ourselves and the other 26 member states, and I'm now talking about has the EU membership benefited the UK? We can go into other questions about peace, stability, and all the other issues relating to um, the question of institutional democracy. I don't think it's democratic. I'll get that one out of the way for a start. In respect to the trade deficit, in 2011, our trade deficit, this is current account transactions, goods and services, imports, exports, for those who regard this as a, a fundamental question, which it is. It was 47 billion deficit in 2011. Now, you might think that's a lot of money. By the same token, by 2012, it had gone up to 70 billion. Now, these are ONS statistics. They're not just Eurosceptic views. This is from the Office of National Statistics and the House of Commons Library. In terms of the uh, surplus that we have with the rest of the world, we're running at about 13 billion, and it could be much expanded. And then the other side of the equation is what does the future hold for the UK and Europe? I should say, look at the dysfunctional nature of riots, unemployment, the uh, whole question of democratic legitimacy, which is more general than I can deal with at this moment, but we'll be very happy to deal with later. I'm going to be debating, be debating this on behalf of the House of Commons in Dublin next week with all the other national chairmen of all the other member states. And in a nutshell, the future for the UK and Europe is that if it transforms itself into a workable, non-dysfunctional system, it can help by cooperation between member states. But European government is not a good idea, and you can't have two governments and two parliaments dealing with the same subject matter. I'm a constitutional lawyer, and I'm telling you, as a matter of my personal judgment, that it is not possible to continue with two governments and two parliaments. And we can discuss that later with Professor Bondi, I've no doubt. But in a nutshell, there are very serious problems in the present nature of the European Union, and the relationship with the UK is on the edge. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bill. I'd now like to introduce Professor Andrea Biondi, Director of the Centre for European Law here at King's College London. Andrea. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I'm going to use just uh, 15 seconds of my time just to thank on behalf of uh, the Centre of European Law at King's College London, the House of Parliament, and in particular the Outreach Service. We were extremely happy to be associated in organising this event. I actually think that uh, this is one of the main functions of universities to try to get as much as involved as possible in public life. Whether academics can have any kind of impact, well, that's a different point. But, you know. <clears throat> anyway, Europe. Uh, there are some advantages about coming last because you can simply say everything has been said so eloquently from the previous speakers. So, uh, you know, I could actually just train myself and just simply defer to the, to the experts. But, you know, I'll try to uh, add a couple of uh, comments. Um, I think, you know, it's been mentioned the word already, I think that the theme that we are discussing tonight is really democratic legitimacy in uh, uh, an extremely complex uh, organization such as the European Union. Uh, 
and we've been discussing this theme for the last 50 years. Uh, 2013 actually marks the anniversary of one of the most important judgments of the European Court of Justice, Van Gendel Loss. You might actually say that's really where the problem began. Uh, in that judgment, the court established that uh, the treaty is not just, uh, in those days, was the European economic uh, community, was not just a, another international agreement, but was something different because it did create individual rights. And the court, in trying to justify what was actually a rather revolutionary statement, referred to the preamble of that treaty, which says, we're doing this for the people of Europe. Now, in 1953, there were no people, um, diplomats, ambassadors, bureaucrats, prime ministers, perhaps judges, but not a lot of people. Now, so the question for now is, you know, 50 years down the line, is it still the same case? You know, are we actually still dealing with uh, uh, a European Union without people? Well, I would say that there's been some kind of uh, improvements. First, from the European Union side, uh, we have now a European Parliament, which is a co-legislator together with the European Council. We have uh, a binding charter of fundamental rights, which is usually mentioned when, oh, the, you know, it does actually protect social rights, that's dangerous. But in reality, as many uh, human rights instruments, it works as a check on uh, public authorities' actions, including the EU institutions. So for instance, the charter can be used, is actually used as to uh, make EU institutions' uh, actions more accountable uh, and more transparent. There are even other instruments which I found rather intriguing. For instance, the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, for the very first time, uh, allows European citizens to propose legislation, one million citizen can actually propose legislation that have then to be discussed by the European institutions, which I think is quite an encouraging sign. Uh, anyway, if, if, you, if, if instead you prefer to discuss democratic de legitimacy from a national perspective, I think that once again, there are quite a, encouraging signs that things have changed quite a lot. For instance, uh, the Treaty of Lisbon, for the very first time, recognize within its fundamental principles the need to respect the constitutional and political identity of member states, the very first time, and national parliaments. National parliaments, they, they receive quite a lot of attention by the treaty. For instance, they have a dedicated article which lists a lot of functions uh, for national parliaments. And I'll mention one. Uh, they need to be associated with uh, any kind of revision of the treaty, general revision or a simplified version they have to be associated with the process. And obviously, as mentioned by the previous speakers, the role uh, about scrutinizing EU legislation. I'd just like to add a couple of, uh, of points about you know, this, this, this role for national parliaments. The first, uh, the House of Lords and the House of Commons have been fantastic in this role. I mean, we academics, we just always wait for a report from those houses because we can copy a lot. Uh, but even other national parliaments are doing quite well. And I'd just like to mention one recent uh, example. Um, the Commission proposed uh, new regulations on the right to strike. 12 parliaments, 12 parliaments across Europe, creating a sort of a, a hub between uh, national parliaments. They uh, all express serious concerns about this new uh, proposal. And then the Commission, after two months, simply withdrew it. So it looks like it's working. Second comment is, uh, if a national parliament still dislike a piece of EU legislation because it might be against subsidiarity, disproportionate, does not, you know, it's not, anyway, let's say it's unlawful, uh, the national parliament can ask its own government to bring a specific judicial action before the European Court of Justice. Uh, the European Court of Justice has always been extremely reluctant to get involved in any kind of discussion about allocation of powers between member state and the union, and then because we're friends, you know, we could actually say that usually, when involved, it tended to side it on the EU side. On the EU side. But, but you know, this new form of action, I think, would require the Court of Justice to take a much more robust uh, approach to the question of uh, checking the limits of EU competence. Obviously, there are so many other problems that can be discussed, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the big points is really the coexistence between national parliaments and the European Parliament. Also, the fact that uh, 
EU legislation is most of the time extremely detailed and technical, so sometimes even checking how it works is, is, is complex. Or, for instance, the fact that uh, lawmaking procedures at the European level are so long and so convoluted that, again, it makes more difficult to follow exactly what's going on in Brussels and in Strasbourg. But hey, nobody's perfect, so hopefully we can still improve things in the next 50 years. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Andrea. Now, I've uh, had indications of questions which have been submitted uh, prior to this evening, and um, so I'm uh, going to begin with, with one or two of those equally. Um, I know Bill's got to be off at about half past six for some parliamentary business, possibly, and you may well want to ask questions uh, to Bill and the rest of the panel. So I'll uh, throw it open as soon as I, I possibly can. But first of all, I mean, this is um, very much a, a process one rather than a political one. It's, uh, the question is about what preparations will Parliament and the government be making to inform the public about the benefits of belonging to the EU in the run-up to the referendum? Uh, in other words, you know, how is this going to be handled, this education process? I'm very happy if uh, Sarah and Jake want to chip in as well, but Tim Boswell, do you have any views on that? Well, I suppose, and it's not often a good idea to say it on a platform, my honest answer is I don't know. You need to know that, of course, at the moment, uh, this is the Prime Minister's undertaking, speaking as leader of the Conservative Party rather than as the Prime Minister of a coalition government, and he said, contingent on the return of a Conservative government uh, at the next scheduled date for a general election in 2015, then he would undertake a process of negotiation or renegotiation leading to an in-out referendum. And in parallel, as Bill has reminded us, there is consideration of a private member's bill this week, which actually uh, reflects the substance of that and has been initiated by a Conservative member. Um, all I can do, really, is refer you to what happened last time we had a referendum in 1975 under, as it happened then, a Labour government, which had carried out a process of renegotiation and then gave uh, options and, indeed, uh, paid, for, um, uh, paid for the distribution of literature on behalf of the pro and anti campaign and also issued its own statement as the government. And some people, in turn, felt that that was not particularly... Uh, balanced as a view, um, but uh, we are a very long way away from there. Um, the only other point I'd make at the moment is that um, we are into a renegotiation if these first contingent conditions are fulfilled. We've no idea what that will bring or what the government would then say in terms of recommending to a, uh, to a referendum. And if we were to vote uh, to, in a referendum that we no longer wish to be members of the European Union, which I, is the s substantial question in the draft bill, we would then move into um, Clause 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, which is about the withdrawal procedure. And that would be carried out by our own, under our own national constitution, but we would be required to notify the European authorities. Uh, there would then be a debate in council and uh, a consultation with the European Parliament uh, su suggested that it would lead to some kind of uh, decession arrangements, but if those weren't operational after two years, we could withdraw anyway. So, I mean, to be honest, the message is it's very uncharted territory because it's probably premature to ask the question at the moment. Bill, what role do you see for education in the run-up to a debate? I mean, is it very much going to be the pros and antis? I suppose it depends what the government of the day, what their position is. Well, the arrangements under the present bill, um, which I helped to draft, um, actually contain arrangements to ensure that the Electoral Commission, which will have the last say on the question, and also on the rules that will apply. And generally speaking, uh, the, this matter has been looked at quite extensively for a period of time. And uh, there are such things as ensuring that one side doesn't have a disproportionate amount of money, say, from the European Commission through the back door, as is certainly the case uh, alleged in the case of the Irish referendum, uh, where people were extremely upset about the disproportionate amount of money for the yes vote compared to the no vote. However, there are also questions of impartiality, and there is a question in some 
notices that have been put round saying, given the rancor surrounding the EU, will the British people ever actually receive dispassionate, fully factual information <laughs> about the EU, etc.? Well, the short answer is that it can be done. Yep. And it could be agreed, actually, uh, within the aegis of the Electoral Commission that the paperwork that went out and the amount of time and the extent to which the debate was conducted in public, largely, I have to say, through the BBC, because that's what's going to happen. And we actually called in the BBC into our scrutiny inquiry uh, about, what was it, uh, two months ago, and uh, we asked them a lot of questions about their attitude towards the whole question of dealing with the European issue, um, which is sometimes very heavily criticised uh, because of the nature of the people who get put on, the manner in which the questions get asked, and the frameworking of it all, because there is an, uh, a lingering uh, near certain suspicion, if I can use that expression, that there is a, a cultural attitude within the BBC which is not entirely helpful to the Eurosceptic argument which has been winning by proof of fact. <laughs> However, the fact is, just to answer your question shortly, that the um, nature of the uh, inquiry will have to be properly impartial yes. and yes. I would certainly be pressing during the course of the debate and so will many of our friends to ensure that the rules guarantee that and um, one, last, one last thing to reply, not to reply, but to comment on Tim's point about what the nature of the renegotiation would be as John, as, uh, sorry, I said John Major, didn't I? As um, <laughs> David Cameron uh, put it, uh, the fact is that uh, it is not certain as to what the nature of his idea of renegotiation will be by any means. And for the reasons I gave you before, which is that this is the, the wording in the present bill is about our membership of the European Union. Do you want to be remain a, a member of the European Union? And that raises the fundamental question I raised when I said two governments, two parliaments, democratic legitimacy, cost benefit, all these things. And I'm afraid that at the moment, there is no clear definition of what is fundamental except in the minds of those like myself and a very, very large proportion of the electorate and of the House of Commons on our side of the equation who say we need fundamental renegotiation and that is a constitutional change in the relationship and not merely tinkering and with the treaties. Uh, thanks for that, Bill. I, I can't possibly comment on the BBC's position in all this, but uh, no, that, no. that's for far more important we'll, people we'll than talk, me, nearer the time. We'll, we'll discuss that in due yeah, course. Yeah, Do Jake and, uh, and, and Sarah want to chip in on this process at this stage? No. <laughs> Definitive no to that. Very quickly, and I'm going to ask Andrea this uh, and then throw it open. There's a, an interesting point made by uh, somebody prior to the uh, meeting. What EU laws directly affect everyday life? Well, uh, actually, uh, it does affect uh, every aspect of our day's life, from, uh, from, from the food that uh, we're eating, because obviously the kind of controls on uh, uh, additives uh, or the kind of labelling that has to be put, from uh, the right to go to another member state to receive medical treatment uh, if uh, uh, it cannot be available in all member states, from maternity rights, uh, from uh, the kind of uh, the kind of you know where you're going and how you're going to recycle your old fridge. So in reality, you know that's actually also you know your quality of life. Uh, think about uh, uh, prices on wine. I mean that's uh, actually you know it's a result a little bit of uh, European law because in the old days the UK used to uh, tax uh, wine 30 times more than beer, but that cannot be done under European law. So it, 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 it's a striking uh, fact that. Uh, uh, European law does affect uh, seriously everyday life. And that's why I, I, I always found it a bit difficult. Uh, it, there's another question about you know, what's going to happen with all these laws if the UK leaves. I think that it would be extremely complicated to start disentangling uh, the UK from, uh, from the vapors in a very, very wide effect uh, of EU regulation on, on many aspects of uh, uh, everyday life. Thank you very much. Well, Given the timetable and um, Bill's availability for, for a short time longer, I'm going to throw it open now. I would urge you, we haven't got roving microphones, but if you could um, basically 
ask your question as clearly as possible. We do have a roving microphone, so uh, if you could wait till that arrives and then uh, maybe identify yourself and go ahead and ask the question. How does the microphone look? Yep, yes. sounds good to me. Yeah, Brilliant. lady here, thank you. <laughs> just, just there. There, so. Hello, my name is Helen Jeffries and I work in a central government department. And so I'd like to ask the members of the panel, what is the most helpful thing that a government department can do to help you with EU scrutiny? And conversely, what is the least helpful thing that we could do? What would really annoy you? Tim Boswell? I think the short answer is the most helpful thing you can do is keep in dialogue. If you have a problem, like your minister's going to a council meeting, and uh, needs to get cover to make an agreement, we can, if necessary, and I think the Commons have a different procedure, but substantially, we can give you a scrutiny waiver to do that. We can still keep our gloves on the table and say we're holding the item under reserve. Um, the least helpful thing you can do is to try and bluff and hope we'll go away, because we won't. Yes, uh, we had John Cunliffe, who is the British, uh, the UK ambassador to the European Union it, uh, on two occasions in the last eight weeks. One to give formal evidence, which is on the record, the transcript of which is available for anybody who wants to read it. Um, and the other was an informal meeting that we had with him in Brussels uh, about two weeks ago. Um, this is very important because the interface between the committee and uh, the consideration of the directives um, is very much conducted through the aegis of our debating procedure and our analysis. But what we get is an explanatory memorandum from the government, but it's been brokered effectively by the United Kingdom representatives in Brussels who speak uh, as diplomats to the other member states and their equivalents, it's called CORECA, the Committee of Permanent Representatives, but each member state has its own. Well, for reasons that are pretty obvious, 27 member states uh, talking to one another about these complex questions uh, is a very difficult process. And uh, the most helpful thing that can be done uh, is actually something which Simon Hicks, who you know, of course, uh, who comes from, which is its university, the London School of Economics, and he we, don't, we don't mention that word here. Oh, I beg your pardon, <laughs> right. Well, uh, uh, Simon Hicks came and gave evidence to us last week. And uh, he says, and I think this is a very interesting piece of evidence, that the uh, people who are doing UCREP work, that's the civil servants, through the various departments funneled through UCREP, is actually not a diplomatic service entirely. It is a legislative process. Now, this could have quite a significant bearing on the way we start looking at this, because on the basis that that is the case, then it is really important that we have a completely transparent arrangement. And he's run, and I'm going to leave it at this, uh, a, 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 a project called Vote Watch, which for those of you who are here to be educated on the subject, and I'm very educated by reading their reports, They've been through a very, very large number of regulations and decisions, and the manner in which they were arrived at, and I'll leave you with one statistic, and Sarah will put me right if I've got it wrong. Of all the regulations and decisions that have been taken on which it was possible to arrive at a decision, I think that's the way to put it, which was a possible outcome is the words, France and Lithuania agreed to 100% of everything that went through the system, right? However, you may suddenly think to yourself, oh, well, in ca that case, the belligerent, uh, awkward squad in, in Westminster and in uh, the United Kingdom probably only allowed 30 through. No, we allowed through 90. And I think Simon said last week that, in fact, the figure had gone up to 96. So in practice, what is happening is something which really has to be evaluated because it's not everything the European Commission puts forward. It gets more complicated than that. But there is a, an inbuilt bias to consensus. And that raises questions, I'm sure you'd agree, as a constitutional lawyer, about questions of legitimacy. Because people go into ballot boxes 
in polling booths to put their cross against the decision as to what kind of government they want. And qualified majority voting, which takes place in the Council of Ministers, is not a given, but it is definitely overriding, in many cases, decisions that might otherwise have been extremely controversial within a given member state's parliament. Thank you. As a gentleman over here. Um, <clears throat> David Conway from Civitas. Um, is it not the case that Parliament passed an act, I think in 2011, to the effect that if there is a proposed treaty change, then there will be a referendum, and in a, a referendum on that, and that, therefore, even if David Cameron is not returned as Prime Minister with the Tories after the next general election, should, through the Euro crisis, there be a new proposed treaty indicating fiscal union, for example, we would have an in-out referendum. But more importantly, the question I want to ask you, last time round in 75, and I think I may, may be the only person in the audience old enough to have voted, um, in the audience, I don't know. Anyway, but um, uh, the, 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 the British public were, at the start of the campaign, equally as Eurosceptic as they are now. And yet, in a matter of only a few months, it was turned around, and the BBC was very instrumental in bringing that about, and it has come to light, many years down the line later, that um, uh, there was a lot of foreign funding, in particular American funding, that wasn't a deliberate CIA, attempt to, to bring your, bring your question to an end. Or, or I think, could I just, excuse me, sir, could I just ask you to quickly wind your question up? Thank you. Well, can I, can I, there seem to be two questions there. One about the parliamentary consequences of, of, of 2011. I, I don't know who wants to go first about well, parliamentary. Uh, Bill, 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 I, yeah, I yeah. think perhaps, um, yeah. basically, um, th there are a number of rules. Generally speaking, uh, the uh, European Union Amendment Act 2011 uh, laid down rules for uh, referendums regarding what I think I can generally describe as what were regarded as significant treaty changes. Yes. Actually, under Section 4, uh, and I may tell you I oppose this bill from beginning to end uh, with uh, many colleagues for a very good reason, because we regarded it as really only scratching at the surface. The real problem is that the exemption, for example, on the question that you've raised of fiscal and monetary union, actually uh, was exempted by virtue of section four because section four, I'm paraphrasing, says uh, there would only need to be a referendum if it were not only significant but actually applied to the United Kingdom as well as all the other member states. And the policy of the government has been to say, let them go ahead with the core monetary union proposals, which include a lot of the fiscal package. And the net result of that is that we are excluded from an automatic right to a referendum. However, for those of us of, 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 a, of, a, uh, of that mind, that's been overtaken actually by David Cameron's decision that as far as his government is concerned, or as Tim put it, his party is concerned, uh, this um, in or out referendum, which is included in this bill, if it were to be enacted, uh, would actually completely override all the other um, stuff in the, in the act you referred to. So we're actually at the present moment in quite a good place and that's why I'm putting my name to that bill. I mean, first of all, on the points the bill has made, I wouldn't disagree with his general analysis. I just make two comments. Um, the first is it's open to member states to use an enhanced cooperation procedure. Yeah and they can then go ahead with certain things, and that was the basis for the financial transaction tax. Now, it wouldn't be difficult to see that it has a huge impact on the City of London and has raises issues in connection with the integrity of the single market. And obviously the sorts of assurance that are around there are absolutely central. Um, equally, and we saw this with the so-called fiscal compact, of course, other member states can write a new treaty at any time they like, 
but they just can't call it a European treaty unless and until it's brought into the European Union. So that's that side of it. Second point I rather wanted to pick up because I think Bill has pointed to a, something you should be reassured about if you come from that vein of opinion. I, I think the big change from the 1975 referendum is we now have got the Electoral Commission and that should act as an independent filter against what I might call any attempt to distort it. Now, things can always go wrong and people will often question the decision, particularly if it's not the one they wanted. Um, but on the whole, I hope that uh, at least when we get to a referendum, if we do, it will express the will of the British people and then we'll all know where we are. Andrea? You know, actually, just to reiterate exactly what Lord Boswell said, is that we already have uh, two treaties with the, the Eurozone uh, rules that apply to Eurozone members and then the others. So, you know, in reality, we had a de facto uh, you know, two Europes. And, and I think that is really a matter of great concern because in the past, when you negotiate the monetary union and you had the ECOFIN meeting, you know, the, the, the British Chancellor was there. You know, what you get now is just a short briefing of the meeting uh, of the Eurozone member state at the very beginning and the very end. So, you know, there are some serious constitutional problems that need to be addressed because you have really now two sets of rules. Uh, could I just say I agree with that? And actually, I don't regard this, and I've said it repeatedly in the House of Commons, as a Eurozone crisis. It's a European crisis, European Union crisis. Uh, because, as you quite rightly say, I mentioned before, you can't have two governments and two parliaments. That's my personal opinion, and I think it will break up for practical reasons to do with unemployment and all sorts of things that we haven't got time to go into. But basically, at the constitutional level, and a matter of constitutional propriety, not only do you have the government of the United Kingdom, which has the right, because it's a voluntary engagement through the 1972 Act and Section 2, we could repeal that if we wanted to. In addition to that, we have this accretion of decision-making powers which have been conferred by treaties under that Section 2, which have enabled more and more a growth of the other kind of government, uh, because it's imposed on us through qualified majority vote, which creates the conflict, or at any rate, the dissonance between having a government uh, in the United Kingdom or any other national parliament and the government of Europe, if I can use that general expression. And in addition to that, what Professor Bondi has said is absolutely right, which is that actually there is in addition to that two other governments in the field of monetary union, which is the Eurozone and the non-Eurozone. I regard all this as completely unnecessary, by the way, and I think we should have a convention of all the member states rather like the Philadelphia Convention, and I put this to David Cameron uh, in an open public televised meeting the other day, or a year ago, and I said, really, we need to have such a discussion with all the member states present as in terms of leadership, so the prime ministers are there with their foreign secretaries and all the national parliamentarians, and let's have it out, because actually we could... In maybe two weeks, it may be a bit longer. I believe that with a properly constructed agenda, it would be possible to actually make sense of something which could still work, which is association between member states. But at the moment, it just isn't working. And I think there are constitutional, political, and economic uh, issues at stake. Okay, I think we'll leave the issue about whether the CIA funded the, uh, <laughs> any aspect of the campaign, but I'd love to continue that maybe another time. But there's a gentleman at the very back there. Thank you very much. My name is <clears throat> Peter Cullum. I'm in industry. It's a question about the institutions, firstly for the professor. Uh, it was mentioned that recently under Lisbon, uh, various people got the idea to propose legislation other than the commission. My question is a historical one. What took them so long? Because to us this is fundamental, in that civil servants don't propose legislation, ordinary people do, parliamentarians do, etc. The second point is the European Court of Justice. As I understand it, uh, when a judge takes his oath or her oath, they do so to preserve the union. It, does this automatically create a conflict? Because surely there are wider philosophical implications about a vote by a judge in terms of justice and democracy and all the rest of it. In other words, you know, I'm sure judges in the Soviet Union were there to preserve the system, but that's not their purpose. Thank you. Well, the, the, the role of the European Parliament, well, 
clearly, I mean, it, the European Parliament has been the successive winner of uh, all the changes of the treaty. I mean, every time they, 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 they did extremely well. And what is usually happening now, especially with a rather weak commission, uh, you know, the, the commission keeps on proposing legislation, but now the parliament has su such an extensive power to redraft it, to modify, that in reality is becoming a de facto legislator. So obviously, you know, there are still problems about, uh, uh, about the length of proceedings, the fact that obviously still had to agree with the council. But uh, if you look at uh, some of the recent examples of directives that have been uh, uh, passed, uh, they are most, most of them they are the, uh, 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 the product of the European Parliament, in my view. Concerning the European Court of Justice, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, first of all, uh, the court has changed a lot. Uh, over the years, because it used to be a small uh, unit uh, with, uh, you know, with the rule that yeah, every member state has the right to appoint a judge. Uh, you know, when there were six, uh, nine, eleven, there was a different, uh, uh, a different body. Now there are 27, you know, soon 28 judges. First of all, we had already some problems about consistency of decision between the different chambers, because very rarely now the court decides in its full composition. So there is a problem of organization. What you refer to is the kind of uh, uh, you know, sort of the role of the court. Well, I think that again the Treaty of Lisbon, in my view, has introduced a, a technical uh, point, but a very important one. You know, we never had any kind of checks on appointments of judges. The Treaty of Lisbon instead set up a new committee which now has to vet uh, candidates. And this committee, which is actually chaired by our Supreme Court judge, uh, Lord Mans, has been extremely robust. And we had some, 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 some candidates being rejected on the grounds that they did not have the expertise, they were not qualified enough. So in my view, the, the main point about uh, the Court of Justice is that you know, it has to be subject, as all the other European institutions, to control transparency, in particular, on the quality of appointments. Could I just come in on that and say I'm very glad to hear what Professor Bond is saying. We keep on agreeing. Yeah, yeah I know, it's, it, but it is extraordinary. I, actually, there is far less to disagree about once we've got past the fundamentals, because anybody who sees the potentiality for cooperation between member states in this global contracting world would realize that it's very important to have dialogue and discussion. Actually, on the question of the European Court, of course, each member state has signed a treaty which gives precedence to the, Supreme, to, to the European Court of Justice over its own legal system. Um, and in, indeed, of course, that is represented by Section um, 3 of the European Community Act 1972, which says that every piece of, every decision that is taken by the court is in fact binding on, on our parliament and indeed on us. The case in question which raised the very important issue, uh, which uh, was factor tame, uh, did also, and this is the bit that sometimes gets uh, overlooked, say that, in fact, this is Lord Bridges' judgment, the word voluntary, which I mentioned earlier, which I don't think has been given quite enough uh, emphasis, not today, but in general, and that is that we are abiding by all these laws by the, as it were, umbilical cord of that provision, which is that we agreed to do it voluntarily. And the assumption that has been made, and if I made any contribution to these debates over the last 25 years, it's been to try to draw attention to the fact that our sovereignty in our parliament, or indeed in any other parliament, has not been wiped away, despite the assertions of the European Court of Justice, who actually continue to claim that they have primacy over the constitutional law of all the member states. Now, we've never accepted that, and by the way, nor has Italy, has it? And several other countries, but we are quite emphatic about it. That's the point I want to make. Well, I can't claim to be a lawyer, which Bill is, but I can tell you, and I dare say I'm the only person in the room, I've actually elected judges in a completely different capacity because I used to be a member of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, and I think a distinction we may need to return to later in the questioning, that is, of course, um, uh, in relation to the European Court of Human Rights, and is a completely separate structure and separate convention from anything binding the European Union. I personally would like to give um, an endorsement to the need for 
judicial appraisal and competence, and I think we are improving that, as we should do in the European Convention. I would like, on the other hand, slightly to warn people, and it's up to them, they make their own judgment of, of whether or not this is right. But I don't think that the justices of the European Court of Justice, or indeed it's sometimes argued ex-commissioners who have sworn an oath to the loyalties of the European Union and are receiving a pension therefrom, are necessarily uh, morally inhibited or skewed in their judgments because they're members of an institution. I mean, no more so than if I've taken an oath as a member of the House of Lords, this sort of prevents me from doing what I think is right in relation to anything. Um, I don't believe that, but uh, some people may wish to. I think there's one point on what Bill has said where I'd actually say the news is rather better than in 1972 because we took this very clinical view that we should enshrine um, the but in our own legislation, the primacy of the European Court and its judgments, and of European law over British law, but we retained the notional capacity to withdraw if we found that arrangement intolerable. It's often not noticed, but the Treaty of Lisbon actually now provides for the first time a vehicle under which that can be done. Um, if you look back to the debates in the 70s, People said, but we're joining an, eter you know, an eternal union. And people then said, oh yes, but it's like the United Nations Charter. You, there's no get out clause. There is a get out clause, which I think reinforces the point that there is a fundamental retention of sovereignty if that is what we choose to use. And that, that's Article 50. But there's, a, there's a gentleman just along there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Edward Tynan. And I just wanted to just probe a bit more on what Mr. Cash said. I think he was referring to really the democratic deficit in the EU when he was referring to the Council of Ministers and how some decisions are reached there. Um, I was just wondering, like, can you just maybe comment further, I say, like, on European Council summit level about how important policy decisions are taken and basically how that's fed through into basically scrutiny at national parliament level. Like, is there a lack of information available at national parliament level, like in select committees, etc., on how important decisions are reached at that level, like are minutes taken at those summit meetings that are, you know, d distributed afterwards at national parliament level that you can sort of probe and see why, cert why a certain uh, course was taken or not taken? Well, there were many reasons why I opposed the Maastricht Treaty. I led the rebellion against it, against John Major's government, hence the slip of the tongue the other day, uh, a few <laughs> minutes ago. But actually, uh, one of the reasons was the notion of co-decision. And that was at that point in its infancy. It is now endemic. And for practical purposes, um, when decisions are taken in a huge range of matters, the decisions are taken by co-decision with the European Parliament. And uh, that raises to me a question of democratic legitimacy, not because I'm gonna claim despite the low turnout and all sorts of other things like that, and the lack of knowledge about it, and all sorts of tangential questions. But the fundamental issue, which I came to at the, mentioned at the beginning, which is this business of voting in a ballot box for a national government, a national parliament. Um, and basically, I just can't, despite the fact that I have perfectly good working relations with members of the European Parliament, I, I had a meeting, we, we had a meeting yesterday, as did Tim, with the Constitutional Committee of the European Parliament, the president of which is, the chairman of which is Mr. Cassini from Italy, and so on. And the bottom line is that we have very amicable discussions, but there is a real difference. So when we're talking about democratic legitimacy, uh, there are massive question marks over the extent to which we should be bound by decisions that are taken by co-decision uh, uh, by um, uh, the increasing use of a qualified majority vote <clears throat> and also by the, and I have to say, the relative <clears throat> relationship of European to national parliaments. We had a debate in the House of Commons, I'll make this as my final point here. Last week, uh, I very much insisted against quite a lot of governmental opposition as chairman of the committee, uh, which they eventually gave in on, to have a debate on the question of primacy. My committee examined the monetary union issues 
uh, which have been developing over the last 18 months. And we said we've reached a point, I'm paraphrasing the report now, we've reached a point where we think now the Barroso Commission put out a, a document called the Blueprint for a New Europe, in which they alleged a number of things. It's 52 pages long, and amongst it, it said, the European Parliament, and only it, is the Parliament for the European Union. And they refer to primacy and the take, making of votes in that. Then the Van Rompuy, working in parallel, conclusions in December, the summit, said that the European Parliament, and again I'm slightly paraphrasing, uh, in the conclusions said the European Parliament and the national parliaments are commensurate. Now that is equivalent to saying that both have equal legitimacy. And for the reasons I've given don't need to repeat, that is just simply not accepted by the national parliament. And when we had this debate last week, the Labour, Labour Party put down an amendment on the financial transaction tax. And they said they were in favour of it. But what they did not do, and that's something which the commentariat have not picked up, if I may say so, um, is that they did not suggest that the United Kingdom Parliament did not have primacy, which is what we were saying in the motion. And we said it applies to every voter in every constituency through our national parliament. And that is actually a very important moment because that is the background against which this referendum bill is coming in. Okay? Do you need to... Yeah. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Excellent. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, um, just come back and allow me to be political but not party political for a moment. First point I'd make is we're not the only set of institutions with problems with democratic legitimacy. I think some of us have been quite shocked and certainly have no pleasure in what we've seen from both Turkey and Brazil in countries which do have functioning democracies at the moment. And I think it, it would lead me to the general speculation that a lot of our present difficulties are a function of the current recession and difficult times. And I'm not going into uh, the necessary prescription for dealing with it, but I'm just reflecting the fact that that has strained any democratic system at current. Now, I think, um, as regards the relations between the different bits of this debate and where the le democratic legitimacy can be inserted, I am a pragmatist. I don't think we should necessarily advance with a preconception. I think the European Parliament has got a job to do. It will typically be done on specific areas where they are dealing with European Commission proposals or initiating their own dialogue with the Commission often at a fairly technical level, matters like the services directive, where some British MEPs were very influential, um, current discussions on the common agricultural policy, where there are literally hundreds of amendments. Um, lucky, and I wish them well with those amendments. I think, though, what has been missing is a, a really effective role for the national parliaments. This is one reason we're going to look at that. And this is not confined to Britain. I mean, the Danes and others are also very much interested in beefing this up. And I think we, want, we need to make sure that the, as it were, the executive, be it the Commission or Council, doesn't divide and rule. We allow the European Parliament to work as partners with this, to hold this whole thing more to account. Uh, formally, you are right, at the moment the Council is in a sense um, not directly accountable, but it is of course indirectly accountable through the fact that it is comprised of national governments and their representatives. And if somebody comes back with a rotten deal or issues a uh, an explanatory memorandum to us which is not satisfactory, we should be the first to say so. Could I just Can make one last point? Well, because I'm going now. Very, very briefly. Yeah. Just to say, yeah. bear in mind, strip out all the procedures, all the processes. The whole question ultimately has now reached a point where the... Uh, institutions of the European Union so far and at the moment are insisting on political union. That is the direction of travel. And it's not just the direction of travel, it's actually got there. So we are at a fork in the road and the real question to my mind, and that's why the referendum issue is now on the agenda, is we do not want political union, a lot of other people do. Um, on your behalf, I'd just like to thank Bill, who's got to go. Bill Cash, Chairman of the uh, European uh, Scrutiny Committee, House of Commons, and biographer of John Bright, oh, I, can, I can add. And Bill and I share a common link with John Bright we do, through various yeah. sort of uh, relations. 
We're, we're sort of distant cousins. Aren't we, we are. Yeah. Anyway, thanks very much on your behalf. Okay, there's a gentleman here, and, and do feel free, anybody on questions of procedure, to ask questions to Sarah and, and Jake about the Commons and Lords, respectively. Uh, my name is M Michael McCarthy. I'd like to follow up on what uh, Mr. Cash said about you can't have two par parliaments. It, it doesn't work. And I used to work for the Department for International Development, and I've seen where we're paying for the EU, we're paying for the DFID's budget, and we're doing opposite things. They just do not sit comfortably together. And then you add to that the United Nations, which you're also paying for. And I just wonder, my, I'm instinctively pro-European, but 25,000 people working in the EU, austerity, we're trying to cut our budgets, cut our staff down, yet the, the EU and the European Commission seem to be just going along in their own sweet way. And when you meet them overseas, working in developing countries with the aid program, they just push you aside. They got more money than we have because we've given them that much, all the member states. And often the EU is stand, standing on its own, contrary to what other member states are trying to do in a particular country to help with development. So for me, I think the, the big question is, can the EU trim itself down a bit? Is there any prospect of that? Because it makes a lot of British people fed up, I think. A lot of my friends, anyway, are just fed up with the size of it. 25,000 staff, that's a football crowd. And uh, for what? Okay. Andrea, do you want to come in? I mean, generally, if you think that we're dealing with 500 million people, I mean, if you look at the general, the, the, the whole number of staff of the commission is not that staggering. Uh, but, you know, apart from that point, I mean, again, generally, uh, you know, you, you, you touched upon development aid, which is a very good example. but. Uh, if you, if, if, on the whole, you know, we're talking about a, a, a system which is sort of uh, 50 years old, right? It's a very young system. And for instance, development aid is just, uh, you know, it, it, it's been done right now. For instance, you know, we actually have now more rules how to coordinate uh, commercial policies and development aid. I mean, you know, we are working on these things. And certainly, in my view, just more a question of transparency, coordination with different policies that simply say, well, it doesn't work. Because, for instance, again, on development aid, lots of other member states, they ask for some changes in, in giving more power to the European Union, ask to coordinate better, better policies. Obviously, UK has been extremely uh, active in this area, other member states less. So, once again, I think I found uh, one of the most uh, intriguing development at the, at the level of the European Union is this idea that co common commercial policy, which everybody has agreed that should be done by the European Union should now include also development aid, respect to fundamental human rights, and so on and so forth. I found it an extremely interesting idea. Easy to do it? Not so sure. So, but again, it's just a question of, uh, of, of trying. Tim Boswell. Well, uh, on the specific question, uh, issues about um, different resourcing, contrary policies in relation to development aid, which I'm glad you have stressed the importance of, are very much meat and drink to our subcommittee that deals with that subject uh, and we will look at things like whether an, an EU mission is appropriate, whether it's properly resourced, over salaried or whatever. Can I just answer the general point you raised initially about parliaments? I don't think I'd want to say personally that it is impossible to have two parliaments coexisting. What I think is unfortunate if there isn't a clear understanding of their powers and responsibility. And, of course, that is, uh, if you like, and it's a word that's not always popular in Britain, the task of um, federal constitutions or otherwise. You have to decide at what level you're operating at. I mean, perhaps pre-1865, you could have said the United States had not resolved this in relation to its own arrangements, but you have legislatures at the state level which coexist with the federal level. And um, I think what is the British government is currently undertaking with its balance of competences review, which will play into this European debate, is trying to look objectively at um, how these competences should be articulated, how they're controlled, and whether or not they overlap. And I think we will all look with some interest to see what comes out of that. Uh, but I think we have two upswelling tensions here. One is, rightly, you don't want to have a lot of overlapping bodies wasting money and as I frequently say, we don't want people jetting around Europe at the taxpayers' expense more than is absolutely 
necessary, for example. On the other hand, you do want to sense a common purpose in which the executive, um, at whatever level we choose to have it represented, is accountable to somebody and the ordinary citizen and their concerns and the taxes they pay are properly accounted for. Okay, we've got about 10 more minutes, uh, it seems. I think there was somebody just in this row here. Oh, that's good. Very generous of you to give up your, your yeah. slot. But, oh, well, go ahead if you like. Yeah, yeah, go ahead anyway. Sorry, just ask, uh, my name is Laura Olado and I work in legal services. And the thing is that I didn't really understand why he's a, this other gentleman was objecting to the nature of two parliaments. Because the two parliaments, even if they are colleges, I legislators, they um, protect different interested, interests. You, as a UK Parliament, are in charge of protecting your citizens, but the, the EU Parliament is in charge of protecting the 500 million EU citizens. Mm -hmm. So I do not see why the, the debate is such uh, incompatible. The, the, I don't understand. Maybe if you want to elaborate that and clarify a bit. I don't know. Can we ask you to clarify Bill Cash's views, Tim? Do you think you're <laughs> I'm not so <laughs> sure. I'm not views. so sure I'd want yeah. to speak yeah. for Bill Cash, yeah. although we, we do have a very good working relationship in our capacity. I think he is pointing to the potential dilemma of you know, one man, two masters. And you may have seen the play, which has been playing around here recently. It is difficult. Um, I think it's possible to articulate different levels. But I would agree with him on one thing, which we have not found the perfect balance yet. As Andreas said, it's, it's a comparatively modern experiment. Uh, it's one which we keep making more difficult in one sense by expanding the numbers, which I personally and our committee is, is supportive of. We have glad Croatia's coming in. We'd like the Western Balkans to come in when they're ready. But all of it makes it a little bit more complicated all the time, and uh, we have to have I think a more informed debate, as I hope we've given you tonight. But, you know, it, and, and, and again, it's an experiment which is based on the assumption that there are different level of governments. That's exactly, I mean, I don't believe in a European Union which takes decisions on everything. That, you know, it is not about passing, uh, you know, rules uh, which are the same for everybody. It's just about trying to have multi different level of red governments. And obviously the coexistence between national parliaments and European Parliament is one of the biggest challenges. But that's exactly what the European Union is about. It was one in the front row here. Yeah, just, just here. Yeah, the lady here. Just, yeah. Um, just before I left today, I, uh, sorry, my name's Angela Bennett, and I'm an LLB law student at Birkbeck. Um, I did read that um, the United Kingdom has not signed up for a collective complaint procedure so that the uh, non-government organisations can bring a collective complaint under the European Social Charter. And when I consider such issues and that, you know, we have fundamental rights and freedoms, that is surely a good reason not to come out of the EU so that we're allowed to express our opinions and our concerns about the way that we're governed. Yeah, yeah, I'm conferring, but I think I'm right in saying that this is Council of Europe Convention, the European Social Charter, and it has been the British, and not uniquely the British, position um, that for reasons maybe we think our arrangements are superior, maybe we think, and I suspect this is often in the minds of government, we may think we don't want to make that commitment, but we have not signed up to that particular convention. Now, I mean, that in a sense raises a wider issue, and I don't want to divert you from it, and Andreas may want to comment on the substance, but within a lot, and I noticed one of the questions which had been sort of drafted and came to us, there is a sort of assumption that everything works exactly the same for everyone. Now, it is within one body of law, but I mean, there are a whole series of different overlapping uh, qualifications, and member states may issue reservations about particular things. For example, you take the whole business of justice and home affairs. Now, the British position is, uh, generally, we can opt into those. That's a formal procedure. The Danish government has decided to keep completely out of it, full stop. And they've been permitted to do that under the treaties. Now, of course, it is under the treaties. And I think the case you've cited is in relation to the Council of Europe Convention rather than the European Union legislation. But um, 
uh, and you have to be you have to keep the law, and you, ministers have a duty to comply with it uh, with national and international law. I think, but um, there is more flexibility than we think, and I think sometimes this argument gets um, too much um, polarized. But as regards the merits of the issue, I'd rather pass from giving judgment on that. If I may actually divert you to the European Union side, I think that's a good example of the fact that you, know, you can do things better. For instance, one of the greatest problems about accountability, access to justice, is the fact that uh, NGOs, uh, associations, they have very limited rights under EU law. For instance, it's very difficult to bring a challenge against the directive. The courts are extremely reluctant to allow it, despite the fact that now we have a, a charter, other you know, international also, uh, obligation to do so. So that's exactly one example that the system is not working properly. And then most of the member states are much more advanced than the European Union. But once again, it's just, just a question of uh, trying and trying. So in my view, for instance, uh, you know, one of the next steps is really to make sure that you guarantee, for instance, in the proceedings before the European Court of Justice, it's impossible now either to bring a case or even to present a memoir, just to try to have, you know, the amicus curia uh, example, which I think would actually make uh, the whole process of, ju of judicial adjudication at the European le level much more accountable, more transparent, and closer to citizens. Uh, I think you had another, there's another one coming just from that side. Thank you. Do you remember Jake and Sarah here to take questions on procedure? Feel um, free to throw it. Yeah, anything difficult, we'll throw that away. My question is to do with the fact that if we were to have a referendum, how long does the panel think the public would need to be educated that we would, you know, be able to make a legitimate decision on what should happen? Because it's so con controversial, and people have their different opinions that. I know, I mean, I wasn't, at li I wasn't born for the 1975 election referendum, but I don't know if I'd feel comfortable voting on it. So I just wonder if they have an idea of the time frame that you'd have to have a run up to the referendum. Very interesting uh, point, going back to where we started the discussion, actually. Well, yeah. I mean, the formal position is that we would have about two years from an election in 2015 to conclude a referendum by the end of 2017, if that's the government we elect, and that's the negotiation we take part in. Um, in parallel with that, at some stage, there would need to be a public education um, process. Uh, we discussed earlier, you know, how that would be seen to be fair and authentic. I, I would just say that I think something much worse than, uh, not, uh, than not having a referendum would be to have one without a properly informed public. Now, the difficulty is that um, you have a very difficult um, uh, balance in what is relevant um, because it can either be highly complex and technical or it can be on general, perhaps some people would call it rather woolly issues. And I mean, I don't envy the BBC here in trying to draw this out. I, I don't envy the BBC either. Like, like, like general elections, you know, we have a bit of one and a bit of another and somebody comes along and says, but you're being unkind to duckweed or do something about tap washers. And uh, if you're a constituency candidate, you, which I used to be, you find yourself in some difficulty on those detailed issues. Can I just raise, it's, it's a speculation, but it may, you may like to think about it. The, issue, the, the type of issue which will be discussed in a referendum campaign if we go to that. Uh, do you think, and I don't have a definite view, it will be about economic issues? Do you think it will be about, um, you know, are we better off in or out? Or do you think it will be about political issues? Is this the right kind of enterprise to be a member of? Is it a worthwhile thing um, or not? Now, I'm being very careful not to load that because... Um, I think I have an obligation to be um, non-committed on it. But I do think that somehow the, the referendum debate would be wrong if we didn't at least draw out those two major issues. I mean, in Scotland, they've got, they've had two years. Yeah. It will be, or maybe just under, yeah, for the, the referendum there. Yeah, just to add, I mean, we, we, we just had sort of the end of the year drinks with the students and they organized a referendum. And uh, 80 no, 89 percent yes, and the rest no. So you see, with a well-informed debate, we can have good results. <laughs>
Okay, maybe time for one more. Um, yeah, gentleman over here. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Anthony. It was a long shot um, to, to ask. Uh, I wanted Bill Cash to be here, really, for this question, because he's a very renowned Eurosceptic. And from what I can gather is that we're in the EU for the, for permanently, that we're not going to go out, are we? We, we? We're actually there. Uh, I did some research before I came here today, and apparently the, the US did more for the EU to be established than the UK did after the, the Second World War, when originally the EU was the, it was the, a steel and coal community, wasn't it? That's how it was founded, yeah? I can, do you mind, in the interest of time, just, just, just phrase your question? Okay, I, I see which way you're, yeah, you, you know you, which, you, you're interested in. Uh, yeah. Okay, these so-called referendums that everybody's talking about that we're going to go into the EU, we are in the EU, and that's it, aren't we? There's no going out, is there? That's my question. Okay, well, that's um, an interesting final question. Andrea. Well, I mean, I'd like uh, the UK to stay in Europe, otherwise you know, we won't need a professor of European law any longer. So for selfish reason, I mean, I think that, I hope that, you know, we'll stay in. Uh, however, if you want to leave, yes, as I mentioned before, there's now a specific article in the treaty which lays down a very detailed procedure that member states can follow if they want to leave. So, technically or legally, it can be done. Once again, then we go back to Lord Boswell points, whether you know, we need to start engaging in a discussion about whether you know, this is good to, for economic reasons, whether there are really some values or some, some other issues that actually will mean that the UK needs to stay. But can I also just add a, a, an extra point? We should not also forget the contribution that the UK had on the European Union. There are certain kind of things that all these emphasis on respect for remedies, uh, the rule of law, transparency, that comes from the UK. There are certain kind of piece of legislation which are successful because of the contribution of uh, the UK. And once again, the internal market is a UK invention. You know, 1992 program has been carried out by English officials of the Commission. So once again, I think I hope that uh, we stay. Yeah, I mean, first of all, on the point Andreas just made, the um, Director General of DG Mark is, of course, John, is a, Jonathan Paul is a Brit. And I mean, he has absolute, um, really the lead position in relation to the internal market. And, and as um, has been said, Britain is influential. I think the referendum gives an opportunity for what you might call a contestable decision. I mean, if people really want to leave, and that is the, their considered judgment, they have an opportunity to do so. And uh, I would respect their position, whatever they wanted to do. I would just say one thing in conclusion, and this is not a threat, and it isn't designed, as it were, to load the referendum. Whatever decision is made, there will be a need for Britain to come to an accommodation with its neighbours. It may not be a formal constitutional arrangement, but we do have countries close to us who are trading, who are active, and one assumes even if we've left the European Union, and Andras has lost his job, and I've lost mine, because we <laughs> both arise from that, that we will have to um, find some way of dealing with them. And uh, that is perhaps a consideration, but um, I think we rest on events. Thank you. That's a good thought to end with, resting <laughs> on events and an awful lot to think about. It's been a fascinating discussion, uh, debate, and very good questions. A lot to think about between now and 2017. But on behalf of the Houses of Parliament Outreach Service in King's College London, I'd like to thank all of you for coming along and contributing. There are refreshments to follow, and you are very welcome to uh, stay on for that. And uh, on your behalf, I'd like to thank uh, Sarah Davis and Jake Vaughan. I'm sure they'll be staying on and can maybe chat a bit more about some of the aspects of uh, what we've been discussing. But particularly thank Professor Andrea Biondi and Lord Boswell as uh, two of our main speakers this evening. Thank you very much for being here.